Hi folks. I miss you all. Here we are in our Interpreting the New Testament class. Theo 1004 at the University of Nottingham, Department of Theology and Religious Studies. And I'm Dr. Sarah Parks, your remote instructor. So in class, we talked about the books of Luke and Acts. We've been going through the Gospels, we've made it to Luke, and we already met in person and talked about Luke Acts, but I didn't record that. So I'm going to go back and go over our slides uh, on Luke Acts that we did in class together and just make a little revision recording for you from those. Um, to accompany Luke Acts lecture, you've got two readings in your textbook by Bart Ehrman. You've got the chapter on Luke and the chapter on the book of Acts. So you've got to read those. But as you know, you always also have some primary text readings. So for this topic, for this part of the class, you've also got to read the Gospel of Luke in its entirety. You don't have to read Acts unless you want to, because that's a lot of reading. But as you know, I really like for you to read the primary texts, if at all possible, in one sitting. So you get to see the whole book, the shape of the book, the flavor of the book. You can, I can tell you all kinds of things about the author's aims and the themes and all of that. But you can see those things for yourself and think critically about what I'm telling you or what the textbook is telling you if you look at the whole book on its own, not just pick and choose a line here and there out of context. So yes, I encourage you to have read the entire book of Luke, if possible in one sitting, to accompany this lecture. Um, the first slide is called The Basics. So we just have we always talk about sort of date and themes and authorship. So here's what we talked about in class. Luke is almost certainly, um, for a non-Jewish audience, unlike Matthew and Mark, which we've talked about. Like Matthew, Luke takes Mark and adds lots of additional material to it birth narrative, sayings, material from Jesus, um, post-resurrection appearances, just like Matthew. So your textbook talks about the comparative method. Every chapter talks about a different method. The Luke chapter talks about the comparative method, where you lay the four canonical gospels side by side and compare how they treat stuff, what is included in some and not included in others. And what can we learn about the author's aims based on what he has included or not included? Luke is the only gospel with a sequel. The book of Acts is sort of Luke volume two. Uh, Luke is the only canonical gospel with a formal preface. Um, in typical sort of first century Greco-Roman historians style. So quite different in style from the other gospels we've looked at so far. In a way, Luke is what we might call socially conservative, kind of um, an upstanding, appropriate Roman citizen type thing, particularly regarding women. We have seen in other gospels that uh, the kind of social situation around the Jesus movement is a bit countercultural. Not so in Luke. Luke is liking to see women in subservient places, just like good Roman ladies. Um, however, on the flip side, Luke is very interested in the downtrodden. Luke is interested in lifting up the, the oppressed of society. So maybe not gender oppression, um, but certainly any other kind of economic oppression, for example. And Luke is perhaps more than the other Gospels we've looked at so far, something that we call supersessionist, which is a way to describe certain places in, for example, the New Testament, where 
a shift is happening where Jesus was Jewish. His followers were Jewish when he walked the earth. Um, His concerns and his teachings were about Judaism, reform within Judaism. Um, And most of the New Testament is Jewish in its way. Luke is one of the locations in the New Testament where something is happening that's moving the focus out of Judaism toward non-Jews and welcoming non-Jews to join the movement. And what supersessionism means is in fact having non-Jews replace Jews in the movement, uh, which obviously has had historical horrific consequences down through the centuries, depending on how people read that material and what they do with it. So that is something we'll talk about for the Gospel of Luke. Your textbook, The New Testament, A Historical Introduction to the Early Christian Writings, 6th edition by Bart Ehrman, has these great little at-a-glance boxes, and they, I put one on your slides, and they sort of give you a great little revision capsule for each chapter. So what your textbook has to say for at a glance for the Gospel of Luke uh, says the date range. Your author comes down in, in the date window of around 80 to 85 CE. So that as we talked about before, dates of New Testament writings are often, we don't know exactly, but we sort of give a window when we think it's most likely that the book was written. So your textbook author says in the 80s. Um, others, there's a wider window for that. Other scholars uh, put it a little later, but he says 80s. Says it's written by a Greek-speaking Jesus follower living outside of Palestine. Um, says that Luke used sources. Luke is, himself mentions that. Some of those sources were probably the Gospel of Mark, the sayings of Jesus that we have been nicknaming Q in our class, and something we call L, which stands for Luke and special material. So things that Luke himself got somewhere else. Your textbook mentions that we're using a comparative method of analysis when we look at Luke. We use a different method for each book. Mentions that what this reveals is that Luke has added several really important things um, for the life of Jesus, such as um, the most popular birth narrative or the events surrounding Jesus' birth. Also, Luke is doing something with the temple. Luke places the temple at key points in his narrative and uh, kind of does that for two reasons, some more positive and some more negative about the temple. Um, Luke is concerned to show that salvation, which he says is brought by Jesus, was rejected by most Jewish people and was then given to non-Jews. Luke explains this movement of God's salvation from Jew to non-Jew by portraying Jesus as a Jewish prophet. So, in the tradition of Jewish prophecy, biblical prophecy, a prophet is often rejected, hailed by some and then rejected by others and often killed. So this is how Luke sets up, um, wants us to imagine Jesus' life as well. And in Luke, everything that happens to Jesus is all according to plan, according to the divine plan. Even this thing where the movement has um, not gone particularly well in certain Jewish circles and has thus shifted over to non-Jews, all of this, according to Luke, was all part of the plan all along. And your author of the textbook, Ehrman, says this is why Luke produced a second volume, the Book of Acts. So Luke is kind of, the Gospel of Luke is kind of the setup, the background and the setup of the situation. And then Acts is sort of the history of how it happened, how the Christian mission, as he calls it, was accomplished. Let's circle back and talk about the temple 
as a central focus in Luke Acts. You see on your slides a couple of places where the temple is specifically mentioned. In Luke and Acts, um, we'll talk more about why it's important. And there's a whole section in your te textbook too about why it's important. But it definitely pops up in ways that it doesn't so much in other Gospels. Who is the author? Who's the author of Luke? That's um, what's on the next slide. What we know is that it's the only gospel that has a formal prologue. So what do that, does that maybe tell us about the author? It's the only gospel to mention. I use sources. I use these sources. So that's sort of something that a historian, a, f a f more formal historian would do. So what does that tell us about the author? It's the only gospel writer to come out and say he himself is not an eyewitness. So what does that tell us about the maybe the time frame of the author a little bit later? Um, or the geographical location? Maybe not, say, Galilee, for example. Um, this author shows a particular concern for outcasts, the poor, the downtrodden, and foreigners, non-Jews, outsiders. And perhaps, I'm not sure about this, but maybe he's the only non-Jewish gospel writer in the canon. That's debatable, but certainly first language is Greek. Um, certainly is aimed at the most non-Jewish kind of audience, which we'll talk about. But yet, obviously, he's still inside the circle of Judaism somehow because he knows and uses writings that came to form the Hebrew Bible. Um, but some scholars think maybe he joined Judaism, wasn't raised in it, but joined later as a proselyte, as a sort of uh, fan, someone who came into Jewish circles and embraced it. But wasn't brought up with it. One tradition, sort of the, the church tradition, says that maybe Luke, the author of Luke Acts, was Luke the physician, who's mentioned as a traveling companion of Paul in Colossians and Philemon and 2 Timothy. And this tradition is mentioned in what we call the Miratorian Canon. So it's around the third or the fourth century. And what are the pros and cons of this kind of uh, tradition that the church has of Luke, the, the physician, the guy who traveled around with Paul, then wrote this gospel along with the book of Acts? The pros are, there are two of them. One, there are these weird we passages in the book of Acts. Like Acts is third person. They went and they did this and he said and Jesus did that uh, and um, you know Paul did this and that but once in a while it switches into the first person plural like and then we went here and we were confronted with blah 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 so why would it switch into those first person plural passages well, maybe it's because the sky Luke was there with Paul going around. Secondly, why do we think this is possible? Uh, because there's a tradition, tradition of it. Maybe the tradition is not till the fourth century, but still it's earlier than other tradition, any other tradition. So those are the two pros. The cons are, if this were written by someone who traveled around with Paul, then why would it actually contradict Paul's letters so much? Like historians who try to reconstruct the adventures of Paul and the travels of Paul and the order in which things happened, they've, they look to the letters of Paul and they look to the book of Acts because they're both about Paul's travels in one way or another. But what they found is that it's very difficult to reconcile Acts with what Paul says. And so 
as we learned, if you're trying to be a historian, there's a preference for something to be more likely to be historically accurate if it's not removed from the person. So if it's written by the person, if it's written by Paul, he probably knows better which city he went to first and how long he stayed there than a different person. Um, also date. I mean, Paul's letters are the earliest documents in the New Testament, and Luke Acts is in the 80s at the earliest. Therefore, um, if Acts and Paul's early authentic letters contradict each other in terms of where Paul went and how long he stayed and what he did, if you have to let one go, you should let Acts go because it's later. And so what does this have to do with Luke Acts being written by a companion of Paul? Well, um, if the person was traveling around with Paul, they'd be likely to not make so many mistakes about where Paul went and when. Secondly, the author doesn't seem to know Paul all that well. In fact, the tone is almost like Paul is a great hero of the faith from the past. So there's that tone that makes us think, mm, this was not a buddy of Paul. And then thirdly, there is no mention in Acts of any of the contents of Paul's letters. Uh, so if a person hung around with Paul, it seems like he wrote a lot of letters and they were kind of a big part of his network of communication and planning and, and shepherding and um, going around on his mission. So if you had been privy to that and with him for that, wouldn't you kind of know more about what was in those letters? But no. And then lastly, some of the speeches don't seem very Pauline at all. And so therefore, that's why scholars who take a more historical approach don't think that the tradition of Luke, the physician who traveled around with Paul, is likely to be um, true. Uh, so who do historians think the author was? The short answer is we don't know and we probably will never we don't have enough evidence to know and we probably never will unless something gets miraculously dug up that was preserved in a great condition since the first century so in the end we can't know for sure but we can know a few things about this author we can know that the author was a jesus believer and some kind of non-jew like either a only a jew by um, conversion or uh, becoming a proselyte later in life, but perhaps a Jesus-believing non-Jew who knew Jewish um, customs and Jewish sources and Jesus-following sources well enough to assemble them. Definitely educated somehow, maybe a scribe, maybe a learned person, maybe an educated enslaved person, but definitely with that prologue and then nice writing um, the person had some kind of education who wrote Luke Acts. And maybe those travel narratives are one of the sources that this author used. Maybe this author who claims, I've compiled all these different sources and I'm going to make an orderly account, maybe one of those sources was a travel narrative from a companion of Paul. But these are all, these are all hypotheses. So all we have about this author is hypotheses based on the style of writing and other things like that. In the next video, we'll talk more about that style of writing, especially we'll talk about the formal preface that begins Luke Acts and what it can tell us about um, the author and the contents of the book. But we'll stop here for now because that's enough to simmer with. <laughs>